Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Aaron said, my name is Tyler Zaki, and I'm one of the organizers for KernelCon. This morning, I have the pleasure of introducing our first keynote. And uh, the first time I crossed paths with our keynote was about five years ago at a security conference in South Dakota where I was a student in his hardware hacking class. And at the time, I pretty much knew nothing about hardware or electronics, but uh, wanted to take his class because of his hacker accolades. And uh, I wanted to share those with you now. Um, so our keynote um, was part of the legendary loft heavy industry uh, security group who famously testified to Congress in the 90s about the security of the internet. Additionally, he co-hosted a cable television show called Prototype This. Um, he also developed the first DEF CON electronic badge and many badges thereafter. And finally, he's uh, had his hands in many awesome trainings, presentations, and research along the way. Most recently for that last category, he's been hacking hardware crypto wallets um, and making headlines with that. And if you haven't seen his video kind of showcasing those things, I uh, highly recommend checking it out. But for those reasons, I was excited to take his class. And uh, so I signed up and was curious about the person I was going to meet. And uh, the person I ended up meeting was someone who was extremely passionate and willing to share information with anyone and everyone, no matter who you were, and someone who was humble and easy to talk to and crazy down to earth. And I think those uh, attributes exemplify the best, not only in hackers, but in people. And so our keynote is a very good guy. Um, so the last thing I want to say, and I, I'm not sure if he knows this, but like I said at the time when I took the class, I knew nothing about hardware or electronics. and after taking that class, I was inspired and all of a sudden interested in doing all those things. And because of that, um, I've had the opportunity to make the badges this year and the previous three or four years. And so, uh, essentially, there's a, a little bit of our keynote in every Chrome Come badge. So, I want to say thank you to our keynote for inspiring me and assuming inspiring many others. And uh, with that, um, I would get to introduce uh, Kingpin, a.k.a. Joe Grant. Hello. I have tears in my eyes. That was so nice. Um, can you hear me? Because I can hear me. Is this too, not, not too loud or anything? Okay. Um, cool. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm Joe Grant. I'm a hacker. Um, it's really it's really cool to be here. I've actually never been to Nebraska, and uh, actually when I first met Tyler was the first time that I was in South Dakota. So I'm trying to like check lots of places off the list. So um, this is this is very cool. It's an honor to to be here and, and give a talk. So I'm going to preface this, and you can leave if you want when you see this slide. Um, this is not a technical talk. So normally I give technical talks. This is not one. I have no idea what it's going to end up being like, uh, but that's kind of part of the fun, right? It's like trying something new, uh, whether you're hacking or giving a keynote at a conference. Like, let's just see what happens. Um, so this really, you know, when when the, the KernelCon team contacted me, um, they're like, the theme is punk, and I'm like, hell yeah! Like to me, hacking and punk rock are the same, um, and and you'll see what I mean by that. So it really is something like inter intertwined, uh, at least from my perspective. So what, I'm, what I want to do with this talk is sort of talk about the, the key elements that I feel are from the kind of the punk world and that we see in the hacker world, at least that how I grew up with things, because I grew up with both punk and, um, and hacking, uh, and basically showing elements and, and kind of looking at elements that I feel like we want to preserve, right? And as the community grows, as InfoSec becomes a career, which it has now for a long time, um, but just kind of like looking looking back at what makes hacking so special and what makes conferences like this so special, especially small ones and groups of people and the power of community and all of these things, like that's that's really important. So 
this is my attempt of, of doing that. I, you know, I'm, I'm by no means a motivational speaker of any, of any kind. Um, but these, these are things that really resonate with me a lot. Um, and, and I feel very strongly about these things. Uh, so hopefully this is motivational enough uh, you know, to let you guys go off and do cool things. Um, oh yeah, I guess. Okay, so I'm going to be referring to my notes a lot again because I really have no idea what's going to happen here. Um, but I wanted to ask a question. Like, when when you think of hacking, like, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Kevin Mitnick, just yell stuff out. Fun. Root. Terminal. Root terminal. Nerd. Bell phone system. Did someone say nerd? On the train. On the train. On the train. Model trains. Oh, model trains. Yes, that's right. Yeah, the, the found, foundation of Tech Model Railroad Club. Captain Crunch. Captain Crunch discovering knowledge. Okay, so now what about if you ask, say, your grandparents, or if you ask the media what hacking is? Criminal. Criminal. Yeah. Anonymous. Anonymous. Ransomware. Ransomware, right? So it's all the negative stuff. So we kind of know, as a community, what the good side of hacking is. Not everybody knows that. What about when when you think about punk? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Freedom. Freedom. Rebel. Rebel. Spiky, hair. Spiky hair. Drugs. <laughs> Music. Sid and Nancy. Sid and Nancy. <laughs> What's that? Poorly designed. Poorly designed. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, and, and the same thing, you know, really with with punk and hacking, both as these subcultures that are now, you know, maybe more mainstream, um, you, you have negative connotations, you have positive connotations. When I think of punk, I think of community, I think of helping each other, I think about fucking the system, uh, maybe not as much now that I'm older, but you know, pushing back against things, asking questions, helping each other, uh, fighting, for people who might not be able to fight for themselves. But then you have the negative aspects too of drug use and breaking things and smashing things and, and all the and all you know that the negative side. But there's a lot of positivity that grew from the original punk roots, which were more destructive, into more community building and positive aspects. Uh, that are really that are really interesting. What's that? Well, truck usually was the positive thing. Well, for a lot of people, it was, right, as sort of the outlet. So there are good and bad to everything, and, and that's what, I'm, what I want to at least kind of reflect on is, is, is the good side. And that's what I've spent, you know, basically my life doing. And I think my perspective is definitely on, like, the naive, um, ide idealistic side. Because, yeah, there's, you know, the world is pretty screwed up. Um, but within my own world, I like to just look at that, at, at the positive elements of that. Here's a disclaimer. I figured I should put this in. You know, I have some pictures of album covers, and there's lyrics with swear words and things. Um, so I just want to put this in. If you have some sensitive people um, in the in the room, just beware. And yeah, so so this um, basically what I'm going to use is like lyrics from songs that kind of stuck with me. And there's a whole you know world of punk music. There's a whole world of hacking, and you can't know everything about everything. Right? That's just kind of the nature of it. Um, this is just a brief kind of history, like for whatever reason, and I'm still trying to work this out, I've always gravitated towards these underground kind of communities, trying to find a place to fit in. Uh, even going to punk shows when I was 10, I think, was my first show. Uh, and I still go to this day, usually alone, because I don't have any other friends that go. Uh, and I brought my kids a couple times and my wife, but they're not really into it, right? They don't have like that, that passion for it. Um, but just like I have passion for hacking, I have passion for underground music. Uh, so I started going at a you know, very early age, started skateboarding at a very early age, used computers at a very early age, and none of these things were accepted. It was like, if you, if you skateboarded, you would get beat up. Uh, I mean, we were chased out of places. Just other kids wouldn't like you because you skateboarded. If you use computers, forget it. Like, you were just a you know, super nerd. Um, you know, you get made fun of and tormented and, and all these things. And maybe that is why I gravitated towards punk and hardcore music or something. I have no idea. But anyway, the point is, 
I think they're connected, and that's how this whole talk is gonna, you know, come together. And I think, you know, I think it's safe to say, like, the computers, I never really felt comfortable around lots of other people. Like, I love being at conferences, but that's about it. And that's because I know that we're all kind of the same mindset. Uh, and computers, to me, like, discovering bullet board systems and, and being able to connect to other people and then trade information uh, to get cooler passwords to systems or to, you know, get, you know, I was doing a lot of stuff back then, more technological juvenile delinquency, which basically, you know, kind of being a punk online and offline. But it was just that, that community of, of sharing and trading and stuff, and I think that was really important. This is a little progression of, of music that I was into. Uh, and again, this is you know a sampling. Everybody that's into music or everybody that's into hacking is going to have their own perspective, their own story, their own bands. But these are ones that really stuck with me. Uh, so starting off kind of L.A. West Coast punk, um, I had an older brother who uh, one of his friends introduced me to, to some of these bands. He even had actually the the Circle Jerks. There's somebody in the crowd with the Circle Jerk shirt. If you look at his shirt, it's a yellow one over here. Uh, there's a, a picture of like a guy dancing. And this was back in like 80, I don't know, 85 or something like that. Uh, my brother's friend had a tattoo of it. And people with tattoos back then were scary, right? They were either like complete criminals or like people in the Navy or something. Um, <laughs> so it was really like, to me to see this guy who really was probably only 18, or 19 or something, like, he is so cool. He has a tattoo and all this stuff. So I started listening to this music, and it just seemed normal to me. Just like hacking seemed normal to me, because I grew up doing it. And, um, you know, being able to read the lyrics and understand it's okay to express yourself and be who you are and, and inspire and share and destroy or whatever it is. Like, it all seemed normal. I didn't realize that that was a subculture of something else. Um, got into the Misfits more East Coast style, uh, horror punk, and then into hardcore. The Misfits, though, I love them so much that I actually, one of my first handles was, was called Astro Zombie, which is a Misfits song. And uh, I don't know why I didn't keep that one. I think it's actually better than Kingpin. But yeah, so then got into more New York, New York style hardcore, which to me was, you know, kind of an offshoot of punk, a little more positive, um, a, a little harder, and uh, it just, it shaped my entire life at the same time as you know, I was listening to all this stuff as I was in the law, and as I was hacking, and as I was giving talks and, and everything. So it's you know all connected. Um, I did also notice that the was anyone at the speaker party last night? I guess the speakers were. Um, there was a, uh, a it was at Beer Cave in um, somewhere down around here, and I walk in when I, when I got there, they're playing Minor Threat, and I'm like, this is cool, play Minor Threat, and then there's just you know arcade games of course, which is awesome. So this piece of writing, which was in FRAC uh, in 1986, it was FRAC issue 7, volume 1. So one of the first issues of FRAC magazine, which was a text file about freaking and hacking and all of those things, highly recommended to read all of them. Uh, I guess an e-zine, if you would. Uh, who, has, who has read this before, The Conscience of a Hacker? Okay, not too many. So I'll give you a second to read it. I had this printed out on, on my door of my uh, of my childhood bedroom for a long time. That's like, that's powerful stuff, right? That's written by the mentor who is uh, an old, old school hacker in Legion of Doom. And this, this was the mindset back in the day, and even still to this day, right? It's like, we are just curious kids or grown-ups that want to explore, that want to support people in trade and, and not have to deal with the government side of things. Like when I read this, I, I don't know the mentor personally, and I'm guessing that he also you know, have some sort of connection to to punk rock. I could be wrong, but that's a very like bold statement, and this affected a lot of people. 
think it was also, was it mentioned in, in Hackers? Yes, in Hackers. So if you've seen the movie Hackers, they've mentioned this. So really, really a seminal piece of, piece of writing. And he actually gave a talk at Hope uh, in New York a couple years ago uh, about that, maybe more than a couple years ago now. But to me, this is, more, this is just as powerful as any sort of music theory. So here's, a, here's an example that I think of something similar just coming from the, from the music side. I'm not going to read these out loud, so I'll just, you know, uh, either stop talking or just let you read them as I'm talking. But re read that and, you know, see, see if you can find any similarities. Yeah, so there's, yeah, you know, society's control, and it's still, you know, also to be very anti-authoritarian, um, uh, um, non-conformist sort of thing, right? It's like, yeah, screw you guys. And separate genres, right? Hacking and music, but those, those to me, like Rise Above and the Hacker Manifesto to me are like the, the, the linchpins of everything, you know, that, that comes after. So as far as the, you know, the music scene, the punk music scene was very graphic oriented, very, um, uh, kind of out there to get your attention, and, and you'll see, you know, political messages or anti-political messages, and uh, just stuff, stuff to get you in. And these, a lot of times, like to me, when I see flyers of shows, those those tell me like the real DIY kind of community element of it, right? Like people are xeroxing these. A lot of times, it would be kids at school using like the office copy machine. And then taping them all over the all over the, the city or the town or whatever. Um, everything was kind of run and supported by the community, just like a conference, right? There's uh, people volunteering to do these things, and yes, that probably happens with other types of communities as well. But to me, it seemed obvious. And, and these things like are just just, just such a good kind of grab of like that's cool like what's agnostic front that you know that looks awesome i want to go check that out and that's kind of how it was to get people in from the hacking side we actually have some similar history uh so cult of the dead cow one of the earliest hacker groups and definitely the most uh bold as far as what they're doing or what they did in the community if has anyone read the cult of the dead cow book came out recently. Yeah, a couple of people. Uh, yeah, check that out if you want to read a little bit of history about CDC. There's some lops up in there too. Um, I'm not endorsing it. I'm not not endorsing it. Uh, but if you're curious, just look at it. Uh, but yeah, these, these guys, and there is some there is some cross-pollination between the, the group in Boston that I was involved in, Loft, and there's actually some Loft guys in the photos. Um, you might even be able to spot uh, a young Joe Grand in one of those photos. But they really took the over-the-top punk aesthetic into hacking. Uh, the picture on the upper left was from Beyond Hope in 2000. No, Hackers on Planet Earth, um, H2K, I believe it was. And um, I think they were, they just released Backorphis 2K, BO2K, uh, at Defcon 7, which you have to look at that video. I literally just watched it before I came down here. Uh, if you search, you know, search online, DEF CON 7, bo 2 k or Cult of the Dead Cow, or whatever, that presentation basically is like a giant show. And then Dildog comes on stage with like the technical stuff. But it was just this great presentation to get attention of like, look what we're doing. Like, it doesn't have to just be somebody standing up at the podium saying technical stuff. Like, you can have fun with it and really get it out there and, and really... Like, they were doing a lot of it to get media attention as well, right? To get people in and, and spread their message. Seeing, like, the code abode thing, that was what um, a guy named Drunk Fox had done as, you know, an advertisement, a flyer for his bullet board system back in the day. And to me, I, you know, I see some similarities between that stuff and this stuff, for sure. Um, and then, like, the lower left is just another kind of, you know, ASCII art text flyer. So yeah, they, they've always been a real inspiration in like combining the publicity side, the hacking side, the, the music side, uh, and you know, just the complete over-the-topness of it. So another similarity with, with punk and, and, and hacking, before we get into some like specific themes, is 
again, the community aspect of it. So community spaces, uh, from, from the punk side, you had squat houses, uh, community art centers, safe places that people could go if they were houseless or had problems, uh, places where they have concerts and shows and everything, all, you know, all again, DIY. Um, some of the famous ones, there's like uh, the church in Los Angeles. Uh, there's a documentary called The Decline of uh, Western Civilization from 1980 that talks all about the early LA punk scene. And there's a bunch of, uh, a bunch of guys in different bands and they're all living in this abandoned church that they've turned into a, a practice space and a living space. Uh, and completely, you know, bonkers, stoned out of their mind and everything, but they're still all coming together to support each other. Uh, so that's one. There's, like, C-Squat is one in the Lower East Side of New York City. Uh, ABC No Rio is another one. And all over the place, from the hacker side, we have the loft, which I'll show you this little video clip just to, just to sort of see what it was like back in the 90s. Uh, there was New Hack City was another one in Boston that were, you know, a bunch of hackers coming together. Uh, there was a uh, Chaos Computer Club. So all these kind of groups of like-minded people supporting each other and doing projects and doing things. Uh, and, and that's an important part, right? Community, it's, it's not really about what the next cool thing is that you can show off or if you come on stage and do something. It's just, it's more than that. And, and, and we'll get into that. So anyway, here's, if you, if you haven't seen uh, anything about the law before, this, this to me was, I joined this group when I was 15 or 16, and I had just gotten arrested. Uh, and I'd been, you know, I'd known all the Boston hackers before then, but they were kind of like, eh, Joe's like a little bit young and dumb, like we're not gonna let him in. Uh, and they were right, of course, so I got in trouble. Um, and came back, and then they kind of took me in under their wing. And I, I still, even to this day, they, they have never answered, like, why me? Like, why'd they take me when there's lots of other hackers that are out there that are not getting in trouble? Uh, and, you know, plenty of other people, but it ended up being, you know, basically seven of us uh, in, in this clubhouse. And this was a very early time. This was at our first space, and it really was a, was a space for hackers to come and hang out and sleep on the floor, and uh, we would hack on things and set up our own networks and ultimately find, you know, vulnerabilities at Microsoft and stuff that led to other things. But at the beginning, it was this very kind of anarchist, flat, hierarchical, not high, whatever, you know what I mean? flat system. <laughs> no boss. And that was a very, also very kind of punk rock um, side of things. And that changed over time. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give some stories, I think, a little bit later of how that um, changed. But yeah, very um, influential and, uh, and, and formative time in, in, my, in my world and in the hacker world as well. So let's see if this works. The audio is 1990s video tape, so be aware. You know, everything in the love was carried by hand up the stairs. So, just remember that when you see the bats. Two bats. Here we go. You know, some people have asked, like, exactly, you know, what is the, what is the loft? And I was just like, well, it's like a clubhouse. <laughs> so we don't have, we don't have secret handshakes or anything. But it's neat too when we have, when we have like friends over, like visiting from out of state or whatever. Um, and they're into computers like we are, you know, there's a place we can all, we, 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 we all bring them here, and they can, they can sleep here. And initially we were just looking for storage space, you know, to just store stuff. And it's turned into sort of a, like a communal, a weird communal thing. I've had a lot of stuff for years, it's been in my basement, just sitting there. And I've never been able to use it. And now I've been able to bring it over here to the loft and actually use the stuff and play with it and see what it can actually do. Talk to somebody, you know, over the day and say, uh, I got a question about, you know, blah, 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 and it's like, all right, let me take out my manual and look it up. Well, I mean, here you can go and read somebody else's manual or ask them face to face. It's a lot easier to share information when you're talking face to face. All these non <laughs> Yeah, no shit. Sure. The actual hardware, you can't get that online. And, yeah. So you can. Like, I want to tell you, let's not hack that way 311. Well, <laughs> come here, you can hack our own land. You know, I don't care. It's just. It's this project of me trying to prove it work. Um, it's basically it's a telephone dialer run off a uh, microprocessor. It's like a demon dialer, um, a hack tape. Um, you can just do, it does all the tones, blue box, red box, green box. It's just the access to the technology is, 
is like centralized here, you know, in a place where anybody can come, you know, who's really into it and uh, and uh, and learn. And that's the that's the most important thing. We want to learn about everything. So. Yeah, that, that video clip was from a documentary called Unauthorized Access uh, by Anne-Lisa Savage that's online. And there's a, a, a link at the end to, I think it's infocon.org that has all these old documentaries and, and stuff. So, yeah, that was the first time, well, that was the first time I'd ever been filmed. I don't know if you noticed that kid with the gray sweatshirt on. That was me. Uh, but that was where I learned about the importance of sharing information, right, and, and kind of teaching people what you know, and having Count Zero, the guy who was sort of the main, the main Inya person speaking, he was always really good at sharing information and, and that passion side. So that's what really, that's where I learned, okay, like you can have this power and you can teach other people, and that's okay, like you don't have to keep it all to yourself, you don't have to use it in a malicious way, and, and that, was, that was huge. So I guess the first thing that is similar with punk and hacking, or at least the first element that I that I think we need to preserve um, is is not forgetting about our history. So don't forget your roots is a very common theme across lots of areas, uh, especially in music. As music changed, and, and I think also with uh, with hacking. But as you'll see, I think it's important to kind of know where we all came from, and we're kind of all standing on the shoulders of each other and the giants. But history is is, is good, but it's not that important. Like it's good to kind of know, but like as as we'll talk about, it's it's us who are people who are here now, kind of creating the next thing. But it's I think it's important as more money gets in and more uh, kind of seriousness about hacking and security and stuff. So yeah, I guess the I guess the better way to say it is like you know there's a, a colorful history, right? But um, and we can use that as kind of a stepping stone for things, but we definitely don't have to focus on the past. Here, here's some cool just historical pieces. I didn't want to turn this into like a history lesson, um, but I thought like there's some key things that are just too cool not to show. Uh, so Captain Crunch whistle from back in the day to, that generated if you hold down one of the one side of the whistle, it would create a 2600 hertz tone, which you could then use to, to take control of a phone, switch, and then route phone calls. That was, uh, you know, before the internet, the phone system was the thing that people were, were going after. We had, you know, the famous blue box. Does anybody recognize that guy on the left? Steve Wozniak, yeah, so uh, one, one of the two, or I guess one of the three Apple founders, um, Steve had said, there's, there's a quote, and he said this a number of times, of like, or maybe it was Steve Jobs, who had said, without blue boxes, there would be no Apple. And it was, was it was? Yeah, and there was just this subculture of, you know, kind of the hippie culture and this, this youth culture, anti-government, screw my bell, you know, we want to communicate with our friends, we want to talk to, to our friends in other places in the country or the world without paying ridiculous amounts of money. Uh, and they kind of got some seed money by selling these devices in you know, university and, and whoever else. Uh, what's also funny is, uh, you know, from this there were red boxes that people would make that would generate coin tones so you could get free phone calls on, on pay phones and things. And I was selling those when I was younger. Uh, but I was just listening to an interview on the way here on a podcast called One Life, One Chance, which is uh, by Toby Morris, who's the singer of H2O, which is the slide I just showed, interviewing Keith Morris, from Circle Jerks, who I showed an uh, album cover of earlier, and he was actually reminiscing about back in the day when, when bands would go on tour, punk bands, where they had no support, nobody liked them, you know, they were getting in fights, and the cops were pulling them over and all this stuff, but they were on the road, living out of a van, and needed a way to still call home and call their friends. So they were actually doing the same sort of hacking and phone freaking that we were as hackers, using red boxes, using calling cards, uh, using voicemail systems, all for communication. So it's just this other connection I thought was really cool. A lot of early magazines, uh, Tap, Yipple, 2600 is still around, Hacktick was, was Dutch, so you know, there's a worldwide kind of phenomenon of this stuff going on, but just lots of these really cool things. 
Um, Hack Take, the, the slogan in Dutch there, uh, says magazine for techno anarchists. So just, you know, again, another sort of combination of things. Uh, a lot of great books. There's so many, I only, only picked a few. Uh, there are a lot of not so good books also, uh, but a lot of ones that really show these early, these early stages. There's also Exploding the Phone, which I just started reading. Um, there's The Watchman about Kevin Coulson. Of course, there's stuff about Mitnick, The Who's Egg. And it kind of shows the, the hacker ethos, especially like the, the first one, the hacker's book, which had a couple prints, really shows that early hacker ethos before there was money involved and, and everything else. There were computer groups long before the law. Like when I was growing up, I'm like, yeah, we're, we're the first US hacker space. And I was very proud of that. But then learning like, oh, there were kids way before me doing this stuff, right? So again, we're just, we're just standing on the shoulders of giants, of other people that are doing this stuff. And maybe it's getting bigger, but that passion is still the same. So the former forest, some, somewhat local to here, was Milwaukee, right? We're kind of close to Milwaukee. <laughs> close enough. Um, but these are kids that were all just, you know, curious and they were connecting. I'm not even going to say hacking into systems because they were dialing into systems with modems that were unprotected, and they were messing around, and, and unintentionally, for the most part, uh, you know, they, they were causing mischief unintentionally because they were exploring the systems, and you know, they were poorly documented. Uh, but it's been going on a long time, right? And, and the media has always loved it. So that Newsweek is from 1980. I can't even see it. 1982 or three or something like that. And then, you know, there were early conferences also, early meetups, early gatherings. And that they, these are what I think is so special about our community still, is like we have massive conferences, right? The industry conferences where there's 30,000 people and they're fun, but they're a much different feel than smaller regional conferences like this. And that's what's so cool that everybody's here, right? That you're here for this because the small ones always just feel more communal and more personal, and that's where you meet new friends, and that's where you learn new things in just a better environment, instead of just being crushed by lots of people. Uh, and, and you know, it started way, way back in the day. There's like, um, we, we held what we called grillathons in Boston, and this was pre-loft days, uh, where it was just this local hackers from the bullet board systems of like, hey, let's you know, get on uh, Brian's roof and have a cookout. And we just did, and it was really fun to see people in person and then there was like very early hacker conferences like HoboCon, SummerCon, PumpCon, TriCon, which were maybe 30, 40 people. And then it got bigger over time. Uh, but yeah, you know, there's just a lot, of, a lot of cool stuff happening for a long time. When I was on the phone with the KernelCon guys, one of them had mentioned like, oh, you know, I wonder what it would have been like to, to uh, you know, be involved like back, you know, when you were. And this song immediately popped into my head. Because, like, yeah, it was cool, but in the grand scheme of things, like, there's cool things that are going on now that I think are way more important. Uh, and it was just that period of time. So this song really stuck out to me because it's sort of like, yeah, you know, you can think about the past, but the point is that you're here now. Like, you're here doing stuff. A lot of people in the past are not doing things anymore. They're not contributing to the community. They're not contributing to the hacking culture or whatever. Um, so yeah, this, this one to me is, is really powerful. Like, yeah, we can think about the past, but the future uh, you know, is where we're going, and that's up to you. There's also this other thing I got, I got during COVID, I got really into um, like meditation, which I wouldn't say really into. We use it more of like a therapeutic thing, but I, I know that I've always needed something to kind of bring my mind down a little bit. Uh, so I started meditating, and I think this is, I heard this somewhere within that of like, Yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, and today is a gift. Or something like that, right? But the point is, like, history is cool, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but, like, now we're doing stuff. And, and I think that, that was very powerful to me also. Another element, this is really important, uh, you know, the, the, punk, the punk world was definitely, you had your groups, and you had your fights, but in general, it was all outcasts and misfits for whatever reason. Like, I showed up there, I didn't have a, 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 any physical abuse in my family. A lot of people did, I showed up there. I might have had other things that, that led me there. But we were all there, right? And that was the important thing. 
uh, especially as this community grows, it's you know it's really important, and that's a, that's a part that we want to keep in our heads. Every everybody belongs, no matter what. Everybody brings different skills to the table. Not everybody wants to be on stage. Some people want to be behind the scenes. Some people just want to come and learn. Like when I would go to to, to shows. I always wanted to be in a band, and I ended up being in one just with some friends much later on, uh, just kind of for fun. But I always wanted to be in one because I just love that aspect, and I always wanted to like tour in a band and all this stuff. And, um, and, it, and it never happened, and I was like, well, that's kind of lame. Like, all I did was go to the show, and I was reading a book about early kind of punk scenes, and somebody in there had said, like, it doesn't matter if you were in the band or if you were selling the merch or if you were uh, making the fan scenes, or if you were just going to the show. Like, that was the scene, everybody doing things. So even, you know, I paid my five bucks and I went to the show, and that was contributing, even though at the time it didn't feel like that to me. So, no matter where you're coming from, right, everybody belongs. I saw this tweet the other day when I was putting these slides together, uh, which also is very powerful, and that hit me because I feel like probably all of us have felt this, at some point, is that true? Right, like why am I doing this? Do I really belong here? No matter how long you've been doing this, I think this is a common feeling. Um, so when this person said this, I'm like, oh, this, this perfectly goes along with my slide. Like I already had that first slide of like, you know, we all belong. Um, and the response of this really show the, the, the power of community, which is funny because Twitter is normally like a horrible place to be. Right? You know, it's like you go there if you just want to be yelled at or see people complain. Uh, but to actually have people respond in a positive way to somebody really shows, like, that's cool. Um, and I don't know the reason why they felt that way. Uh, but it really, I thought, it was, was great to see the responses of, like, yes, you know, of course you belong. Um, there's a place for everybody. And I know that gets harder if there's corporate control or you have to do a certain thing for whatever, but what I always say is like, if you have a passion for something, you'll be able to, you know, follow your heart or follow your dreams or whatever you want to do. Um, this picture in the back is something that um, Steve Christie, who is known as Sushi Dude on Twitter, uh, posted, I think it was last year, kind of did a very informal, non-scientific interview about uh, people's skill levels within InfoSec, of like, how long have you been in InfoSec or Hacker, Hacker World, whatever you want to call it, you know, there is some overlap. Some people say, well, you know, hacking is not InfoSec, and that's, I guess that's kind of true, but I, I you know, they're kind of the same. Whether you, it's kind of like whether you're just getting paid to do it, maybe or not. Uh, but so there's all these different elements, right, of, of security. And the black areas are areas where people don't have experience. So I just thought it was interesting of like, you know, some of us might know this, of no matter how long you've been into it, you can't know everything about everything. It's just not feasible. Uh, you might know a little bit about everything, but generally you're gonna end up focusing on something. So he had posted this in response to that slide of like, look, it's okay if you don't know everything. It's okay if you don't know anything, as long as you like what you're doing. So pretty much everybody in there, no matter how much experience they've had, has some missing gaps because you, you can't know everything, and I think that's, that's important because a lot of times we see, we almost assume that people know more than they do or that we know less than we do. Um, and, and that's not the case, right? It's kind of that negative self-talk that, that is not true. Except there's one at the bottom that people were commenting on of like, well, he seems to know everything about uh, all of it. And uh, the response there was like, well, he'd been in it for 24 and a half years, so maybe he's dabbled in a little bit of stuff, but I, I still don't think so. Um, because what I've been doing this for now a long time, right? I guess if you maybe say 30, 30 years starting with the loft, mine would almost be completely black because I just do things. Well, there's no hardware in there, first of all, um, but I just do things that I like, right? So it really doesn't matter how many boxes you filled or anything. It's just you know, what are you into? This is one of my favorite albums, and, and I wanted to find something about community and bringing people together and unity and everything, so that, that's this one. I didn't know this for a long time, but that picture is, is a drawing of a photo that was a really famous Pulitzer Prize winning photo sometime during the Civil Rights uh, 
movement. And as a kid, I didn't know that. I just thought somebody drew this, this picture, but it's actually based on that. Uh, yeah, it's just really, really interesting kind of elements. And now if we think about like the imposter syndrome or FOMO, fear of missing out, like we're scrolling on Twitter, Instagram, and all this stuff, and it's like, man, that, I wish I wasn't sitting in a hotel room right now. I wish I was out doing something else, or everyone else is having so much fun. Um, this, this song really stuck out to me. And this is, a, this is something I think about a lot when I look at anything online, because I feel the same, same way too, right? I feel the same thing. Um, where you're kind of putting people on, on, on pedestals of like, oh, they look like they're having so much fun there, or this or that. That's not reality, right? What, what people are posting online is what they want you to see online. Uh, and we see this all the time with celebrity influencers and all this stuff, like it's all bullshit. Uh, so take everything you see with a grain of salt, right? Like there's interesting stuff, especially you know within, within the, the hacking community, there's interesting stuff, but even then, if you see a conference presentation about something, it's like, damn, that looks so cool, I wish I could do that. Um, and then you try to do it and it doesn't work, like it might have been that, that people found out they were able to do the attack once, good enough to give the conference talk, but not something that's actually, uh, you know, rep repeatable or, or able to be replicated. So there's always, I wouldn't say there's always like a, a, a um, there's always an element of truth in things, but it's usually, you know, exaggerated in some way. So yeah, this, this one, you know, photographs live, especially in this day and age, it is true, actually always, but in our, in our digital age is always true. Uh, okay, so another theme. This is kind of similar to, you know, everybody belongs, uh, but supporting each other, too. This is, you know, we hear a lot about hacker family. At least I do. I see it a lot mentioned. Hacker family, blah, blah, blah. We're all, you know, together. And, and I think that's true. Uh, and we see this also in, in the punk community of, again, those communal spaces. And, and a lot of times people needed help to survive and live together. Uh, and supporting each other is important. Especially, you know, if we if we have to say set aside some ego or um, whatever else it is, you know, step up to support somebody who needs help who might not be able to to say things on their own for whatever reason. So there's a couple slides here, but this, this Youth for Today album, uh, when I heard this, I was probably 13 when I when I heard this, and this is an album that I've listened to. So many times, I still have the original one, but it's like, this is, if I had to pick any album of any time, like this is the one that I lived off of and kind of set my entire trajectory. So Break Down the Walls was, was one of these, you know, anthems. And to me, this really brings that, that community side, right? Of like everybody's, everybody is, is allowed in. And with the loft, it really was one of these things of like, what's the saying? Like the whole is the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts or something. Like what, with us together in this group was, was huge. And then I saw this, again, putting the slides together. Um, Thomas Roth, awesome, uh, awesome hacker, makes great YouTube videos, has done a lot of, a lot of really interesting work with, with Game Boy and with wallet hacking and all sorts of things. He's, um, uh, I think it's at Kedra Ninja is his main account on Twitter and stack smashing on YouTube. So he hacked the, the Apple AirTag uh, through some fault injection that was using, he was using a Nordic Semiconductor NRF, uh, I can't remember which one, but some general purpose wireless microcontroller that was susceptible to a certain type of hardware attack. The, the attack was known Somebody else had realized that the Nordic devices were vulnerable, but Thomas kind of took the existing knowledge, reverse engineered the, the air tag with some help from other people in the community, and then made a video about it, which was huge. And it was cool because it was, you know, really showed the whole process. And he posted this, it's like, why are people on YouTube, you know, so angry? Um, and the comment 
that this guy wrote about the video is like completely ridiculous, right? It's like typical internet comments. And it just reminded me of like, why? Like, what's the point of somebody being negative about something? Uh, and it's even, you know, so bad now that I don't even read comments on Twitter, which is my only social media, well, YouTube, I don't read any comments. So if you've ever said something to me, I'm sorry, because I don't, I don't even see it. Uh, because it's just all that negativity kind of brings me down, right? And like, this is a guy that's doing so much to share information, and he actually takes this stuff to heart, right? And that kind of like brings him down, and it makes him question, like, why, why am I doing this? And like, it's just bullshit. Like, somebody like that, who, you know, making a comment like that is kind of is just uncalled for. Like, it's just ridiculous. Um, and then Colin O'Flynn, uh, another, you know, hardware hacker, very supportive in the community. Response. And he's basically like, you know, how come you don't see this on, in plumbing videos of somebody bashing the guy talking about, you know, how to fix your sink because the Romans did it first or whatever. Like, it's true. <laughs> um, so the negativity, you just, we don't need it, right? We just want to support each other. And, 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 you know, it's like what I tell my kids. It's like, if you don't have anything good to say, just don't say it. And then there's also, uh, you know, of course, we do have this. We have, we have big personalities and big egos and, um, you know, people that have been around for a long time that feel they're better than other people, which you see that in all communities, but it's not necessary. It doesn't help anybody move forward, and it doesn't matter. There are people that have been in the industry for less than a year that are doing way more amazing stuff than people who have been here for 30 years. So it doesn't, like, time is irrelevant. It's just all about how people are contributing, but you have the, you have the competition, you have the envy, you have the negative posting that just kind of doesn't help anyone. So this is one, another later you can say album, uh, seven inch actually. So yeah, and then you know this was happening in the in the in the punk world as well, right? People were trying to one up or like one band would go and sign to a major label. And instead of being praised and like, cool, now you're going to bring punk out to more people, they got shit for it. And it's like, you know, what's the point? So that's why, they're, they're, again, these similarities are, are real. This is one that's maybe not tied directly to punk, but I think it's more about just like DIY. You can do it. You can do what you want to do if you set your mind to it. Uh, don't give up. Like, hacking is not easy, right? Like, we know that. Uh, especially talking about photos and people giving talks. It's like, you look and go, oh man, they did it, That's, I can't believe they did that. Um, you know, it, 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 whatever it is, like, it, none of it's easy. Nobody that, if, if somebody says something is easy, uh, then I think they're either lying or exaggerating, right? Because a lot of times you don't care about the pain that goes into creating the work or the research or how many times you fail, which is, really more important than how many times you succeeded, right? Because the failures are what actually help you learn and, and guide you towards the, the correct solution. Um, so it, it's something that, you know, I, I, I know for sure that I struggle with this a lot. If I'm having a problem and it's like, is this worth it? Like, why am I doing this? I can't do it. I'm not good enough. All my friends can do fault injection. Why can't I get it working? Uh, you know, it's that, again, it's all that neg neg negative thought or negativity or things really that people aren't directly saying to me, but I feel I'm saying to myself. Uh, and it's just like you get through those, and with anything, engineering, hacking, reverse engineering, whatever it is, you have these problems, you're like, damn, do I really want to do this? Like, I hate hacking, I hate engineering. And then all of a sudden you get it, like you're in the shower, and you're like, oh, that's, I forgot, you know, I forgot to bound this thing, or I forgot to solder the ground wire to the thing. Like then you're like, I love engineering and I love hacking. Um, it's this very cyclical kind of thing. But the key is like, this stuff is hard. It, it's technically complicated. Even if you're running somebody else's script or compiling someone else's code, you know, it's like there was something I think somebody posted. I don't know if it was an XKCD comic or something. Um, and it was like, uh, you know, somebody really sad because they couldn't get their code to compile, and then it's like the next one is like, yes, I have a different error message. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like you're making incremental progress, and then finally you do it. So even developers of these things are having trouble, and you know, it's just it's just what it is. Um, so yeah, this is this is a, a screenshot or a picture from last year's Kernel Con. Woo. 
Hack Live. Yeah, that was one of the. That, that was actually the most fun I've had at a at an event ever, except for this one, of course. Um, <laughs> and this was a hardware hacking challenge, right? And, and, and there was pressure that I kind of put on myself because it's live streamed. You have all your friends watching, and you're like, "Am I going to be able to do this?" And it was only I think we had an hour or something like that, and it was it was super fun. And I had a lot of help from Tyler towards the end to, to make sure we could do it all. Uh, but this is just to sort of show us like the messiness of things. Like nothing's as clean and simple as things appear, whether it's in hacking or in life in general, right? So photographs lie, uh, but I try to at least show you know things are are not always clean and simple, and if you just keep at it and you persist, um, you know then you'll eventually get there. And I'll leave you with this slide, another, my second favorite album of all time. So it applies to everything in life, right? It's a good, good mantra to have. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my attempt of trying to stated the theme of Colonel Con Punk and, and combine it with some you know, elements that I am very passionate about. Um, I love the hacker community. I, 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 I not so much love the corporate side of things, uh, but I love the, the conferences and the passion and the curiosity that people have and that we're continuing to do this stuff even as there are larger conferences and huge companies and billions of dollars that we still come and get to go to villages and learn something new and try something. Uh, that you might not normally want to do, right? So that that's really cool. Uh, I hope there are some things in here that stuck with you. These are clickable links, so I will put my slides up online whenever I go back up to the to the hotel room, um, and I'll send them to the ChronoCon team as well. So you can click on those and kind of dig real deep into history and and, and punk stuff and, and everything as well. Uh, but yeah, so with that, I'll say we we do have maybe a couple minutes for questions, but I'm going to say thank you. Enjoy the show, um, and I'll you know see you around. We can take questions. Okay, awesome. I don't think we have a mic, so if you want to just like yell a question, I can repeat it. If we have any questions. Yes. What are you listening to now? What am I listening to now? Um, <coughs> Jeez, that's a great question. Okay, so actually the, the, the most immediate thing I've been listening to is I was just in Sweden. Um, I got back on Monday, and when I was there, I did a search for like, you know, punk shows, metal shows, because Sweet, Swedish, Sweden and Scandinavia has like a really huge metal scene. Um, so I found this band called Brothers of Metal, which is a, 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 a traditionally, you know, very power, I guess, power metal, Swedish metal with like anthems and, uh, Viking themes and all this stuff, and I, I heard them, and I was like, oh my god. So I went to their show on Sunday night, and it was amazing. So that's what I'm listening to, is Brothers of Metal, uh, and I just can't get it out of my head. And I don't even understand the, the thematic side of it. Like, I have to look stuff up, of like, what's Valhalla and Ysidra, or whatever. Uh, but it's really kind of cool. And it's just like very refreshing to have that, and like you get these these battle cries stuck in your head and stuff. So yeah, Brothers of Metal highly recommended. But also, I'm still listening to all the other stuff too. It's very mood dependent. Like if if I'm feeling a certain way, I'll, I'll listen. I can't listen while I'm doing other work, so it has to be like silent. There's another question. Yes. Ooh, what type of skateboard did I ride? Um, the one that I can remember is a uh, Christian Hussoy, which was like, I think it was like a hammerhead shape. Uh, I maybe had, I remember having blind skateboards later, but Power Peralta boards, independent trucks. I feel like Spitfire wheels. Yeah, and, and skating was, skating was fun because I was hacking almost all the time, and then skating was kind of my other, I had another group, you know, different group of friends that were skaters um, that I would hang out with too, but they didn't, there was no pollination, really. Like, they would make fun of me for using computers, and I would make fun of them for smoking pot. So, <laughs> it all worked out. I guess that's an interesting question. It's like, 
who of you grew up listening to punk music or skateboarding? Like a third of the people, right? So it really does show there's some connection that we're all here. It's kind of cool. Any other questions? How old are your kids? Do they like want to do what you want to do, or do they think that you are? That's a great question. Yeah, so my kids are now 13 and 10. Uh, they both learned how to solder when they were like two years old. <laughs> They've come to conferences. They've helped me set up, you know, hardware hacking things. Uh, and they're just not interested at all. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> and, and what's funny is, which is fine, like as long as they find something they're passionate about, that's fine. Um, my, my worry is that they would end up like I did as a kid. So I'm like, as long as they don't, and I, I didn't do drugs, but I was doing other, I was like, as long as they don't do drugs, or join a gang, or get arrested, I'll be, I'll be fine. And, uh, and they haven't so far, which is good. But yeah, you know, they, and they've known what I've done, they think hacking's cool. Like, they definitely tell their friends my dad's a hacker. Uh, but they didn't really, I don't think I really had any street cred with them until uh, this wallet hacking video that just came out that we released two months ago or something like that. That was about a wallet hacking project I did over the summer, and we, we hacked a Trezor One and got $2 million out of it, uh, which I didn't get to keep, it wasn't mine. Um, and they weren't really excited that I, that I hacked the wallet. Like, they kind of were, because I said, if I hack the wallet, we're gonna get takeout. Um, <laughs> so they were excited about that, but really, they were not, ex they, they didn't care really about what I did until I, until I reached 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. <laughs> Because they're so into YouTube, and they're like, that's what they realize, because you get like the award. And as soon as I hit 100K, they're like, Daddy, you get to order the award. I'm like, what are you talking about? So that was the, that was the thing. Like, now they think I'm cool. <laughs> Which is, you know, if teenagers think their dad is cool, like, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Did you order the award? Did I, hell yes, I ordered the award. <laughs> I actually posted it on Twitter too. I was like, it turns out you get this thing. Um, yeah, I haven't hung it up yet because, like, it's just putting stuff on walls is annoying. Uh, so it's like sitting in my office. Yes, I will put it, put it up. Uh, and yeah, so that's, you know, and then my son comes in and they're like, you, you need to have a, a streaming station and you have to do your live streams for your community. And he was so excited. But before that, they didn't, they didn't really care. I do know that they've taken elements of like my attitude of sharing and trying to stay humble and helping people and all of that stuff. Like, they've taken that and applied it in their own way, which is really awesome to see, like, through community service and things they do through their school and stuff like that. That's the thing, is, like, taking these elements, even if they're not in the community, like, that doesn't affect me at all. It doesn't matter. But they take those and get to apply those in their own communities, which is pretty cool. Yeah, like how does it feel to have someone like Tyler uh, say the things that he said, right? And say that I'm an inspiration and all of this stuff. It, it, like it feels really good, um, but at one, you know, it, it's like I, I'm only doing what I like to do. So it's awesome to be able to inspire people, uh, but I wasn't doing it really for that. It was just to share that stuff. So it's it's very it's humbling, right? It's a great it's a great feeling to know that people actually listen or care or do something with it. Um, and it, yeah, it's awesome. That's like what the community is, right? Because people are going to come here, they're going to see his stuff, and they're going to say, "I want to get into X Y Z," or they're going to come to Colonel Con and meet somebody and go off and create their own hacker group or their own company or their own whatever. So it's all these stepping stones, and that's. That's the cool thing about it. Yeah, it feels it feels awesome, but I don't I, I don't let it go to my head. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like it's really cool, but like it doesn't change my passion about what I do. It's just very exciting to see that other people like that stuff. Yes. Were you playing video games as they were coming out? Uh, was I playing video games as they were coming out? Well, so when I was a kid, yeah. Like when I when I first got into computers, it wasn't for hacking. It was for trading games. So I would collect all the games. And that I could through bulletin board systems, then it was like, okay, now I get to go to other bulletin board systems. How do I make free phone calls? Blah, blah, blah. And then it turned into that. So I, I, I was kind of a gamer just because I was hoarding all the games and I would try to play them. But I wasn't good at them. 
And I basically stopped playing games when I was probably 13, and then it just went full on like credit card fraud, riding in the nose, all the other stuff that I shouldn't be doing. Um, and, and, and I used to also, like when, when my friends would have birthday parties and everybody would go to the, the arcade, and the parents would be like, here's five dollars and quarters, like for each person to play games. Like I would just keep the money and then watch other people play, and then I could go spend the money later. So yeah, I'm not, not a great gamer. I don't have, I can't get into it enough, but my kids are full on like Minecraft, Fortnite, you know, 18 hours a day type of stuff. And who am I to tell them not to use the computer? So, <laughs> They'll learn on their own what their limits are. Is there anything about those communities that you were part of back then that you don't see as much now? You think you can just come back? Are there any parts of, the, of communities that I was involved in back then that um, I feel like need to come back? Um, it's hard to know because I'm not involved in any sort of communities now, but I think just the important thing if people are in communities, they're forming communities, right? Of like, it's really hard to find people that you actually mesh with well for close-knit community things. Um, you know, it's like there's always this human nature aspect of somebody to want to take more control. And that happened at the loft. It happened when we when we sold the loft. That was one of the things we kind of lost track of our of our roots a little bit. Sold the loft to start at stake, which was the first public or first you know um, uh, uh, boutique security consulting company before you were allowed to do research just for fun. Uh, but it was venture capital backed and it ruined the whole thing. But people had changed and, and the money got involved and power got involved. So I think the most important thing, even though I, I don't see it because I'm not involved in it, is just making sure everybody is kind of kept in check and contributes to the whole thing and doesn't try to run off and do something on their own. Because we, we kind of you know let certain people out on a leash a little bit uh, and then change the, 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 the dynamic of the group. You want one other, one other question? Okay. okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. So, so basically, the, the overarching theme is that there is not a lot of diversity, and what can we do to bring more diversity into the community? Uh, I will say that it's much better now than it was five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago. So, we're definitely making strides there. Um, and 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 I've been thinking about that too. Of like, how can we get more interest um, from underserved communities and, and other diversities that maybe don't have access to computers that might excel at right or like these different types um, I think conferences like this are huge right having welcoming environments that aren't these massive things where people go and feel like they have to be a certain thing um, so these small events uh, are great for wel welcoming people in um, if there's any you know hacker spaces maker spaces in a particular area maybe holding events um, going to schools to try to get people involved I don't you know I don't Really know, um, but I think it's it's always important to keep that in mind right? because a lot of us are, you know, white males, and we don't need more white males. We need everyone. Um, so it's yeah. How how do we do that? It's definitely a, a tricky question, but I think it's definitely it's happening. Um, I, I just think more outreach uh, and and getting access to communities and to to kids really. And adults, but also kids that, that they can look up to somebody and be like, that person's like me. I want to be involved in that community, right? Um, so I guess it's mostly just getting the message out there, spreading the word, trying to just reach people that might not know about these events, but might come here and be like, oh my god, this is the best thing ever. I want this to be my life. So good. Thank you again. Thank, I appreciate the question too. Awesome. And, uh,